Welcome to Connecting Things. This is a monthly speaker series uh, that generally takes place here at the lab. Sometimes we, we satellite and have other remote locations. So it's really important that you follow along on social media, on our Instagram. We also have a newsletter. Our website's connectingthings.co. Be in the know. We have had an amazing uh, litany of speakers. We have an amazing privilege this morning to introduce our speaker, uh, Mr. Dave Ali. Will you guys give it up for Dave? Dave is uh, Dave's the founder of Almond Surfboards and Amateur Microphone Wear. A lot of you probably know about Almond Surfboards. We're going to get to hear the full story from Dave today, but at least from my perspective, if I can brag about Dave for a second, I think they've done a phenomenal job um, creating, a, creating a business and staying true and authentic to who they are. I think it's something that we can all learn a lot from. Um, no pressure, but he's going to drop the knowledge on us this morning to, to share a little bit of the insights and hopefully there are some takeaways for you guys. Um, all right, so without further ado, here's Dave Ali. Please give him a warm Connected Things welcome. Hello, 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 hello. Hi. Amateur microphone user. Am amateur microphone user. Amateur. Hi. Hi, guys. Good morning. Am I cool? <laughs> Equidistant from both speakers. Is that helpful? I walk. I wander. It's going to happen. Hi, good morning. My name is Dave, and I run a brand called Almond Surfboards. Uh, for those of you who don't know anything about Almond, I'm going to try to catch it up quickly because I don't want to just spend the whole time talking about things that happened years ago. So we build surfboards and apparel and have been doing so for about eight years. We have a retail store on Santa Ana and 17th here in Costa Mesa, which has actually been our third stop around town. That is our store. Those are our surfboards. Would you hit it again? Those are some of the products we make. Just painting a picture here for you guys. And that is my small team. So, 2008, I graduated college from Chapman. At that time, I was kind of like shaping surfboards for fun, doing a little bit of graphic design, studying business marketing, super adamantly not wanting to start a brand because I felt like that was like the overly cliche Costa Mesa kid thing to do. So, yes, thank you. So I was like pretty resistant to it, but it was kind of like where all of those worlds collided and the nice thing about like 2008 when I really got serious about it was that there was commercial real estate available like everywhere. There wasn't a whole lot going on. I graduated from college. There's like not a lot of bright shining job prospects. So I was like, what the heck? I'm going to do this for a year and see what happens. And if you go to the next, there you go. That's our first store. Uh, that was on old Newport Boulevard, kind of on the way to the beach if you're coming from Newport Heights. But, uh, so anyway, 22 years old, no idea what I'm doing. We, at that point, I think we had made 30 surfboards total. Um, oh, I'm missing a huge part. So anyway, so I am not the shaper of almond surfboards. I'm a really good enthusiasm guy. I've been told my gift to the world is getting people excited about whatever I'm excited about. So naturally, I just try to align myself with people who are far more talented than I am. So if we go back like two slides to my, there, one slide to the team. Uh, I was fortunate enough, so 2008, let's talk about like the context. Uh, economy is like this, commercial real estate's available, everyone's kind of hanging out looking for something to do. Their surfboard world was kind of in this like weird transition of like the ride everything. If you're a surfer, this might make more sense. Movement was just kind of like really getting some legs where like was, it used to be very polarized. Like you're either a longboarder or you're a shortboarder, and all of a sudden it's kind of like merging into the middle, which was like total dumb luck on our part. And I met the man in the top left corner, Griffin Newman Kyle. He was apprenticing for Bruce Jones, like putting in his time, 
super hardworking, super humble guy, hates attention. Like you literally could not get him to stand up here and talk about himself. He doesn't even come to our shop parties because he's like, I don't want the attention. I don't want to be the guy. Um, so that's really what was like kind of the catalyst. It was like, great, I can like try to get people excited. You can like make an actual product that people want to pay money for. This is rad. Uh, so we opened this store pretty much like at that point, it was like, Griffin, you're going to make the surfboards. I'm going to like do whatever it is I do, which I'm still deciding. And we're going to open a store. So that is that shop on Old Newport Boulevard. A lot of people were like, wow, this is amazing. You're 22 years old. Like Griffin's, I think, 19. You guys are opening a store. This is incredible and super impressed. What they did not know is our rent was $400 a month. So it was like, how could we not? This is great. So here we are diving headlong into opening a store. I'm going to like kind of dispel some of these like, I don't know, I feel like things look all polished and super professional from the outside. Part of me as I'm telling my story here is going to be like telling you guys the real version. So $400 a month rent is like the real version. Um, so we like bought a bunch of used furniture and filled this space up with like big bulky couches because we literally had like 20 surfboards and like maybe 140 t-shirts. So like it, we're trying to make it feel all full like we knew what we were doing. And we just kind of like went for it and threw, opened the door and put yourselves on the map and kind of like waited to see who would come in. And the first, so what's the next slide? Yeah, years one through four, thank you. Uh, the first several years are very exciting because everything is new. Like every victory is your biggest victory yet. I remember when it used to be like, oh man, if we could do one surfboard a week, we would be golden. And then it was like, oh man, if we could do four surfboards a week, we would be like on top of the world. And I remember like the first time we sold four surfboards in the same week and it was, I was over the moon, just so pumped and like validated and like, we're doing this, this is awesome. And then it just becomes your new normal, you know, like, and so the, to get that same level of excitement all of a sudden is like completely out of reach. So anyway, but in the first couple of years, you're like pumped because we're learning new product categories. We're learning how to make new stuff. We're getting into new markets. Like I remember the first time we were in a surf magazine, it was in Japan. And all these people from Japan are emailing and calling one to become our Japanese distributors. I'm like, this is insane. Like I'm 23 and people in Japan want to sell our stuff. This is so exciting. And then like the guy who ended up becoming our distributor comes walking in the door one day, like, hi, my name's Tomo and I want to sell your surfboards in Japan. And you're just like, this is unreal. This is so fun. But you're kind of just in this like chasing your tail, like, getting bigger, getting into new markets, making new products, figuring it out as you go. And it's a little bit like all is good and peachy. I don't know, it's cool, it's fun, it's exciting. You're super young. Uh, then you kind of like lose the luster of not being like the new guy anymore and things start to like evolve. So anyway, I'm trying to think of like other lessons from the first four years. So we moved from PCA, or we moved from Old Newport down to PCH. We're like right there next to Yoki Shop on Pacific Coast Highway in Newport. We've kind of got the surfboard thing rolling. Like we're making, I mean, our goal at that point is basically like five or six surfboards a week and we're open six days a week. So like we're doing good. Then the temptation is like, okay, there's only so many hand-shaped surfboards we can realistically make. So let's start getting more serious about the apparel thing. So bring in a friend. We're trying to figure out how to like make clothes like with literally no experience whatsoever really. And driving around downtown LA, sourcing things. We have no idea what we're doing in terms of like designing smart. So little caveat here. Learn the constraints so that you can learn how to like operate within them and bend the rules a little bit. I can't even tell you how many times we've like designed a clothing piece or a surfboard or something and didn't really know what we were asking for or wanting or what, what was possible in terms of like how it gets made. 
And so that'll save you a bunch of like inefficiencies. Like basically learn the process so that you can figure out like how to get creative within that. Back to the story. So the first season, some of you probably have these. We did these sweatshirts that were like overdyed with the stripes printed across the front, and they were like two sizes too big, and the neck opening was like this, not on purpose, and the sleeves were like eight inches too long. You, if you have one, you probably got it like a Crochet Kids warehouse sale. Um, but we were making clothes, you know, like every year for the first four years, I think we like at least doubled in size. So it feels like you're making huge progress. And I feel like I'm like already alluding to gloom and doom. So if you're reading that into what I'm saying, it's coming. Um, so you're kind of in this like, everything's new and exciting. And it's destined to like not stay that way forever. So 2014, spring 2014, we had a men's line that was 70 styles, a women's line that was 40, a surfboard business. We had distributors in Japan and France and Australia and the UK, South Korea, Italy, Canada, like we're selling to shops all over the US. And there was a team of five of us. And we have a retail store and an online store. You know, like there's businesses who just have a retail store or just have an online store or just make clothing or just make surfboards. And here we are like five people trying to do all of it. And it's at the time it was going really well. Like things were clicking, things were growing. The feedback we're getting is awesome. The photo shoots look great because we've got all sorts of talented friends that can like help make that happen. But I kind of started to get this sense of like feeling like there were cracks in the foundation. And I think it was hard for other people to see because it's like the output looks really good. And the product had improved drastically. And sales in terms of like gross numbers were like still on the up and up. But I'm, I was like, I don't think I've ever been so like stressed and miserable and like something was wrong and I could not figure out what it was for like the longest time. So I just have to have like the same conversations with my wife like all the time of like, we're not doing this right. There's a smarter way, like something's not clicking. And I read a ton, which I like, highly recommend. And just kind of like came to terms with the fact that like, we were trying to do so much. And as the world gets more crowded, and as there are more people competing for the same slice of pie, like, we can't be spread so incredibly thin, which is a really hard thing to try to communicate to your team and to your like friends and people you work with when things seem to be going super well. Um, so I basically, after like months of like laboring over like what we're doing and why and like, do I even want to be doing this anymore? was kind of at the point where I'm like, things have never been as good as they are right now, and I've never hated it so much. And it's, I think that's kind of part of the like, journey of entrepreneurship a little bit, going back to like, in the early days, all the victories are like these really like, mountaintop high moments. I think overall, the entrepreneurial experience over the last eight years has been a lot higher highs and a lot lower lows than I would have ever guessed. Like we've accomplished more than I would have ever thought, but at the same time, it's like, boom, you take some blows in like eight years of running a business. So against seemingly all logic from the outside, I had to make the tough decision of like letting a good friend go and like narrowing our line down by about 70%. Oh, can we go to the next slide? So basically, we were going to narrow, my 
plan was let a good friend go, narrow our line down by 70%, which at the time felt insane, sounded insane, and basically, because I felt like our business was like a mile wide and an inch deep, basically I was leveraging everything and counting on the fact that we were going to be able to do more units of that 30% remaining than we had done of any single thing to date. Does that make sense? So like, let's call it, let's say for the sake of the conversation, like we were doing like 300 of like 100 things and now I'm trying to do like 600 each or 700 each of like 30 things. So that's a really scary decision to make because I think there's comfort in diversity and there's comfort in like the bulk of all of it. And so you can kind of hide behind like, oh, if this thing flops, no worries, it's one out of 100 things. But if over here, if this thing flops, it's like, okay, that's one out of 30 things. That's kind of representative of a lot more. So that's kind of like a terrifying decision to make. And it was like a super hard decision to make as a boss and a friend and a like, entrepreneur. Um, so that's ultimately what we did. And that's been like, for the last like year and a half, I guess, or year, that's kind of been like the MO. And I was kind of at that, at the point of making that decision, I was kind of like, either this is going to work or I'm just going to walk because I don't want to continue this way. And it allowed us to get more specialized and we've always had like a really, we've always had kind of like a very specific focus in terms of the brand. Like I know what I like, I know what I don't like. Like I drive Griffin crazy because he's like always coming up with ideas and I'm always like slashing down ideas. Like I know what I want it to feel like, but taking a hard stance in terms of your offerings was kind of where something I had preached for a really long time and never really put into practice because I was too afraid to do so. Um, so if you go to the next slide, something I've been like preaching at my friends a lot in the last year because now I'm like thinking that I'm the expert on product offerings and service offerings is like really polarizing your offerings. So polarizing your offerings, I mean like we want to do the really cool high visibility surfboards and like just make the nicest surfboards we can possibly build. And then t-shirts and board shorts and like things that we like can get good at that kind of can fill in down here and avoid all those things in the middle that aren't, aren't quite cool enough to be like that defines who we want to be as a brand and not so easy that it's like we just need to make those because that's like something that we can sell. Does that make sense? So, okay, so polarizing your offerings. I think this is so key to know what role your, the products and services that you offer play for your business. So for us, that looks like we're gonna make the nicest surfboards we can make and make like these really cool, interesting PR pieces up here. And then we're gonna just like, do all these like slam dunk things that we know we can do season after season with like color updates and like graphic updates and try to avoid like recreating the wheel and like reinventing ourselves every season in this kind of like middle gray zone. Is that like resonating with anyone at all? So that's very like product driven specific. The other example that I thought of is like Braden. Hi, hey Brady. Uh, so his like his situation is different. Brady does a bunch of he's known for you can click the next slide doing a bunch of like high end weddings and all these uh, dramatic destinations, and like worked his way to that so that he has time to spend with family and has time to do can you click the next one photo shoots for friends like shooting Hack and Sean and shooting my 30th birthday and shooting for Pawn Shop Kings and shooting Crochet Kids Lookbook. Like if, if Braden was spending all his time doing 
like mid-range weddings every single weekend, then there's not time for that stuff, right? So his is kind of like the inverse, I guess, a little bit. Like ours is like we drive our brand with like these handmade surfboards and then we sell t-shirts and board shorts and sweatshirts. Does that make sense? Um, so I have a pyramid to illustrate that. I looked up for pyramid diagram and that's what came up and I kind of liked it. <laughs> We're getting a little like archeological architecture in this talk as well. Uh, you can hit the next slide. So cut out that middle zone. Pull larger offerings, cut out that middle zone. Figure out what role everything plays and like polarize it. Kind of the season we're in now, which had kind of like redeemed our whole like story and trajectory for me is, and thank you for bearing through my like illustrations, is knowing who we are and knowing what we're good at and knowing what value we add and pouring deep into those things. And for a lot of years, it was like trying to do too much and finding safety and comfort in the quantity. And I think it's been in the last like six months, really, it's been like the most I've enjoyed almond probably since the early days. And it's been the most successful and the most fulfilling. I think part of that has to do with moving up to east side Costa Mesa and it's a little more like community oriented and there's people coming through and there's like life happening and we're like, we focused in on what we want to be good at and we're like pressing hard into those things and it has like taken me from literally just like a year ago or even like eight months ago, like, I mean, if you could ask some of my close friends because I was very vocal about this. I'm a verbal processor. Uh, I was ready to walk. Like, it's all I had done since graduating college. I was seven years invested. From the outside, it was like, cool, like you have 90,000 Instagram followers and a cool sparkly surfboards. Like, I was like literally at the point where I was going to walk and was like kind of wrestling with like, what happens if almond surfboards just ceases to exist? And I was kind of okay with that. I was like, had kind of had to come to grips with that possibility in order to be able to double down on the things that we wanted to do well. Um, so anyway, that to be that said, I'm so thankful we did it. And Almond probably wouldn't be still going unless we had. And things are going better now than they ever have. So... Super, super, super thankful, but it was not an easy decision. It was not an easy transition. Like, no one's really there to like tell you how to unwind from like having a friend work for you and having that friend no longer work for you. Like, there's just those are the icky, not fun things. And the reality is, is like, Almond has been a huge sacrifice for sure. Side note. Going back to like the $400 a month rent thing in the beginning, I lived at home till I was 28. I didn't move out till I was like about to get married. <laughs> Shout out to my wife who's not here. She has work. Uh, but it's all been worth it because at the end of the day, and Griffin and I joke that all we're making is glorified toys, but at the end of the day, like I do find genuine fulfillment in what we do because we're making something of value and something that's going to last and I think we're like doing things the right way like we always joke that we live in this like 1950s American dream of like two friends who like teamed up to like make something and open a little brick and mortar store and come on in and talk to the like jolly shop owners and buy their goods and it's just kind of this like a little bit outdated approach towards like idealistic entrepreneurship I think but we're having fun and I like really think we're making stuff that's gonna like last and something that people are gonna enjoy. And so I'm super thankful to get to do that. But I have been doing it for eight years and I have been all over the spectrum in terms of like experiences. And so I love 
to talk about this stuff. If you can't tell, I've been like ping ponging around. I literally sat down with a Word document to prepare for this, and I was writing like potential themes or titles at the top, and I wrote 10 themes that I wanted to explore, knowing that I could never fit 10 things into 15, 20 minutes, but I tried anyway. So, if there's anything you guys want to ask, please feel free. If I have the time and bandwidth, I am all for it. If, I, if my mind is elsewhere and you like come into the shop and I'm like working on something and ask me a question and I'm like, look at you like you're a crazy person, it's just because I'm like not in that frame of mind right now. But I would love to talk to anyone who's like an entrepreneur, thinking about becoming an entrepreneur. I tried not to touch on the like, should I quit my job and start this thing subject because that's like a doozy and I don't want to be held responsible. <laughs> um, that said, does anyone have any questions about starting business? Hi, yes, thank you. A book I gave to Cole last year is called The Hard Thing About the Hard Things by David Horowitz? Ben Horowitz. Ben Horowitz. That's a super good one because he touches on all sorts of like icky stuff about running a business that no one teaches you. So that was super validating. The other one I surprisingly liked was, uh, was like the Starbucks CEO, Charles Schultz. He did a book that was like something onward and upward. But he was talking about the same thing that I was kind of going through. It was like reading it as I was like processing through this, which was like he stepped down as CEO of Starbucks and then like realized there was like cracks in the foundation of like the customer experience. And he was like trying to tell everyone at Starbucks, like, guys, we're blowing it, we're about to go like this. And they were like, everything's fine, we're opening stores like left and right, everything's great. And he's like, no, like I went into Starbucks and like it's all wrong. And so he like saw this like coming and like inserted himself back into the company to like write it before it went wrong. And it was, it's like a pretty interesting thing because I felt like I was like dealing with that a little bit at the same time. So different books will kind of mean different things at different times. But then all the like good marketing, you know, like all the marketing ones. If you guys haven't listened to the Donald Miller Story Brand podcast, highly recommend that. Clarifying your message. I should just come up here and talk about that. Just poached the whole thing. Hey, yeah, question. Hey, Dave. So you, uh, you talked about there was a time when you were like mile wide inch deep. Yes. And, uh, I gotta think that you created all those products and for a, a specific reason because you love them. And do you have any like tangible examples of like how you decided to make the cuts in your life? This doesn't feel right to cut this thing, but I know I should do it. And totally. Hard and yeah. So going back to that. There were a whole bunch of products in that middle zone that I love, that customers love, that we got great feedback on. It looked really cool. But we kind of had to go like case by case basis and be like, is this thing so good and so interesting that it like defines who we want to be as a brand? Yes. And if it's yes, then it's like, okay, let's like hold it over here for a second. And if it's no, then like, is this thing something that's going to help us like build a business financially? Like the reality is, is like you kind of have to have both. There's the brand builders and the bank account builders. Is this thing like a surefire? We can do a thousand of those next year. No. And so there's like, it kind of feels like you're like having something like ripped out of your hands that you like wish you could hold on to. But there were so many pieces where we're like, we just, we can't justify it. Like, there are more interesting things and there are more practical things. And it's not fun to cut that icky stuff. Editing yourself sucks. Like, what's that quote? Like, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have the time. Like, editing sucks. It's so much easier just to say more and more and more. And like, it's new and it's exciting. And you can spend all your time like creating this new stuff. But like, the the like story kind of changes. I think in the, the first four years, it is that. It is like new and new and new and creating new and the excitement of a, achievement. And, and then you start to like 
have to edit yourself down and get more efficient. And it makes a lot less interesting cocktail conversation when people are like, so what's going on at all, man? Like, you got any new markets recently? And I'm like, no, we're actually just like narrowing our focus and trying to like double down and get better at the things we do. And people are like, oh, that bad, huh? Like, sorry I asked. And I'm like, no, it's a really good refining thing, but it doesn't sound cool to talk about. Like, it's way more interesting to say, and then I hopped on a plane to Japan and went and met with our distributor and opened 20 new accounts. And like, we came back and I was like, hurry guys, get the stuff going. <laughs> like that makes a way better story. But that story for me at least was like several years ago. And that's like, it can't always be that. <laughs> yeah. One more. Ooh, the ever, yes. So I'm super tweaky geeky about branding and like brand identities. So the name either needs to like add value or just be like a super innocuous word that doesn't mean anything and once people associate it with your brand then you're like, smooth sailing. I chose the latter. Was like hunting for a word, saw it written somewhere, loved the shape of the word, like A-L-M-O-N-D, like that. Loved that it was six letters so you could break it in half. Loved that it was like A so it'd be listed high up alphabetically. I liked that it was a food and a shape and a color and a flavor but it's not related to the ocean because I didn't want a literal name. And just kind of like, boom, that's it. Just started scribbling almond in my college notebook margins like, and that was it. And at first people were kind of like, almond, like the nut, like I don't get it. Is it supposed to be like a surfboard? I'm like, nope, it's not supposed to be anything. It's just supposed to be a word that I'm staking my claim of. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, guys.